evening, everybody. Okay, you're still awake, you're still alive. That's a good thing. Glad that you all are still here. Glad that you have blood in your veins and that you are ready to go. So, again, my name is Dr. Kevin Considine. I am have the honor and privilege of being the director of the Schreider Institute for Precious Blood Spirituality here at Catholic Theological Union. And it is my honor and my pleasure to give a very, very short, because I said, I said I'd keep it short, a short intro to our keynote speaker, Dr. Susan Abraham. So, Susan is a professor of theology and postcolonial cultures, VP of academic affairs, and dean of faculty at Pacific School of Religion. She spent many years here at CTU, many years as Bob's student, and there's, I'll just say one effusive thing, and I won't embarrass you too much, but there's no better person I can imagine to, to give the keynote here for, the, for this inaugural symposium as we try to honor Bob's life and legacy and try to figure out how it is that we then carry on with the work in spirituality of reconciliation and restorative justice. So it is my true honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Abraham. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I will start my little thing here because I have a thing about time, I'll explain. So uh, Kevin and I uh, started talking about this event a while back, and he was bopping around some ideas with me and with Lynn. We are former students of Bob's uh, from the 90s. Um, feels like yesterday, and oh my God, <laughs> when was it? 30-some years ago, my goodness. So um, we bopped around a few ideas, and we settled on trauma. And I, conf uh, I confess, ever since, I, I am very ambivalent about the category, the concept, trauma. And my experiences, which are limited in this world, have led me to be a little bit skeptical about that term. So I want to explain it, uh, my skepticism, my uh, attempt to work with it, and my attempt to bring Bob's voice into this rethinking of the category. So here's one reason why I'm skeptical about the term. This, was, this happened a few years ago. Uh, a student approached me, I'm sorry uh, students, because this is not about you. Um, <laughs> as, uh, as the dean, you know how it is. Uh, I have to maintain the facade that I am the immovable wall uh, and I have to play the bad guy. This is uh, not my ordinary state of being, uh, but in that case, I have to. So this particular student who the registrar had already talked with me about and said, they're going to come and ask you about this. And this is why it's not going to work. And, and listed like 16 things uh, as to why whatever the student was asking was not going to work. I said, no problem. Uh, let me see what happens when they come and talk to me. So the student appeared. And uh, I mean, the whole thing was a, 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 a scenario. The student stood in the doorway. Now, I already have a problem with that as an Indian. Uh, the doorway, the door, is a liminal space. You either come in or you stay out. Don't stand there. Uh, that to me already, you, you know, it does things to me. So I was watching it and I was aware of what was happening inside me and the student says, uh, explains the problem and says, this is, this is what I want to do. Clearly, it was a workaround. Uh, and it would have jeopardized a number of other things in the institution, including our fairness and equitable equity policies uh, with regard to other students. So as soon as they finished their speech, I said, no, you can't do that. And the student said, when you say no to me in that way, that creates trauma. This is why I find education and the school traumatic. And I remember thinking, this is trauma for you? This is what you define as trauma. And I, I, I felt very self-righteously upset at the use of this word. And I think for me, it became very, very clear that my particular issue with this word or this concept has to do with the way in which it is used in a, let me use the word vulgar, a commonplace, as if it is about the discomfort we feel. And my immediate response to the student was, um, that is not trauma. 
that is called disappointment. So it was my attempt to reframe what the student was saying and my attempt to come to grips with what I myself was feeling. So I remember talking to Bob about this. You know, Bob was a dean. Bob was one of the youngest deans ever in 1977 of a theology school, and this is where he was dean at. And we would often talk about uh, the very strange paths deans have to walk. Um, I have another friend who's also a dean, and the way they describe their work is, I spent 90% of my time shoveling administrative feces. And that is true, you know, it, it is something you give yourself to because it is actually part of the work of hospitality. You try and clean up so that the space, psychological, mental, intellectual, spiritual, physical, all of these spaces remain um, spaces where people can thrive. So we talked about this and he laughed. He said, only you, he said, would say in that direct and blunt way that it, it is disappointment. He said, did the student feel badly that you reframed it right away? Uh, and I said, I don't know. Because uh, it was very annoying that a student was standing in the doorway. So I, re I remember turning my back. I, I just couldn't take the psychic energy anymore. And then I remember saying to uh, the student, either come in or leave. And they didn't understand what I was saying. But I was so aware that that space and the demand, there was some incongruency there. So it starts over there for me, my particular dis, dis ease, if, if you like, with the word trauma. So of course, what do I do constructively? I went and redefined the word policy for myself uh, because I wanted to be able to say clearly what a policy was. So policy is an action that you would do to, uh, to within the parameters of, sorry to use these words, the fiduciary responsibilities of your office, but also with an eye for the limited human and financial resources the institution has. So I'm able to clearly say this is what the office can do. And I'm sorry what you're asking is impossible for my office. So I redefine policy immediately for myself. Trauma was much more difficult. So it's taken me a while, it's about three or four years now, I've been reading a lot about it. And one of the ways in which it is defined is that it's a deeply distressing experience, an emotional shock, followed by long-term neurosis, or a physical injury. I wasn't here this morning, so I missed, I, I believe, some brilliant presenta uh, presentations, and what I was here for was fantastic. Um, you have already defined trauma for us in this space today. But I wanted to push it uh, in a different path. And it's interesting, some of the presentations touched on aspects of what I was thinking. And it made me smile because I know behind all this is the mastermind managing this from the astral sphere. <laughs> that is why we have his image over there. <laughs> so I'm going to be speaking to him a lot because we engaged in a lot of this kind of uh, conversation. For a long time, I, uh, Bob and I would talk about this. In the 90s, when we were doing uh, contextual theology, for example, and Bob had written, you know, he was famous for constructing local theologies. The focus was on the category space. So space as, an, uh, as a concept, as an idea, S the context, the, uh, it was a cultural space. So I was trying to be different that's a cross I bear. And uh, I said to Bob, I said, um, well, what about time? What about temporality? And we would go back and forth with it. And one of the things I remember he said to me was, well, time is more slippery. Temporality is more slippery. And it is highly subjective. Whereas space or spatiality is more concrete. You can, you can give it a name. So people start with what is tangible, concrete, r maybe real, to use very strange words in theology. Um, and temporality seems to be a narrativized, uh, subjective, and uh, slippery. So then I began to think, and this is, a, you know, for 
25 years, I've been thinking about these things. I haven't done anything with it. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I have a thing with time. I always have. So what is time? Bob and I talked about it. Time, in the most basic sense, is our relationship to our star, the sun. We mark, we mark our relationship to our star. Now it is day. Now it is sunrise. Now it is sunset. That is one way to think about time. There is another kind of time, the time that you may be experiencing right now, thinking, oh my god, it's 4.30, and why are we listening to this person? <laughs> um, and as somebody said, uh, good luck on speaking today. Don't fall asleep while you're speaking. Uh, because we experience time in that way, right? It's internal. And precisely because there is that subjective element, it is difficult to define clearly. Now, when trauma happens, something happens to that very subjective sense of time. And Schreiter had written about this a long time ago. When I read from my text, it will be to, rem to remind us of his words. Uh, I just want us to bring him into our space. So this is what he wrote in 1992. He's talking about uh, reconciliation but he talks about time. Much more can be said about reconciliation and the deliverance from suffering. We have tried to follow here, but a few threads in this complex weave, the transformation of violence, the redeeming narrative, the biblical dynamics of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation in our own time. We are standing between the times, effectively at the end of what was called the 20th century awaiting the birth of a new reality. In the midst of that waiting, the suffering from the violence of this century comes rushing toward us, calling for reconciliation. It is a time, this time between the times, for confronting the lie and telling the truth. It is a time to learn to wait and watch, which are, while others rush and rant. It is an exhilarating and exasperating time. So I remember pointing these words out to Bob and saying, but you are talking about time over here. And he said, no, I was using it as a metaphor. Uh, and I said, well, OK, but as a metaphor, could it frame the way in which we do theology? Now. Temporality is one of those sexy topics in cultural, uh, cultural politics, cultural studies. Uh, everybody seems to be writing about time precisely because nobody knows what it is. And academics love things like that, right? The more mumbo jumbo gumbo, it, it is interesting uh, and it behooves the time that we can spend on time. Well, what if, what if? our sense of time is so thrown out of whack that we begin to experience what I have begun to realize is called, what I'm calling, time sickness. Time sickness is a result of trauma. It is a result of moral injury. It is a result of violence. People fall out of joint out of time. They suddenly inhabit a very different reality. They inhabit a reality in which the present is absolutely rooted in the past. The past is never far away. It is right there. And they are very afraid to think about a future because if you rush it, if you rush that sense of future, it feels to them as if it is an even deeper violation. Because they haven't reconciled what happened in the past to their present. And therefore, they can't quickly move to the future. So we would talk about this dynamic. And I confess to you, other than the you know usual run-of-the-mill 
disappointments that happened in my life, I have not faced trauma. I was listening to you speak on Zoom this morning. I confess I was making a trip from San Francisco, the shortest, dis uh, di uh, the shortest distance from San Francisco to, uh, to Chicago Midway is San Francisco, Atlanta, Atlanta Midway. <laughs> and apparently there was a storm somewhere and therefore of course, you know, everything is delayed and didn't arrive until 1 a.m. or something. Um, I was listening to you on Zoom uh, thinking about what happened in Rwanda. The past is not past, it is present. And in order to make a future, so much work has to be done about that past present. And that kind of work has only increased exponentially in our time. It has, it has every single day we are bombarded with what I call traumatic time. And all the responses that we are trying to, um, to think about in constructive ways and as theologians trying to imagine it has to do with this traumatic time. Our job is very difficult because as theologians, and as Bob always told me, you know, he used to tease me about in those years being a baby feminist. <laughs> and as a baby feminist, you know, I, I, was, I was a fundamentalist. I was a fundamentalist feminist. If we can even hold these things in our head together, okay? And he would shake his head and he would say, Susan, that is not the way it's going to go. That form of secular, secular feminism does not have legs. I remember him saying that to me. That form of secular feminism does not have legs. He said, your feminism must have an eschatological frame. And I said, but eschatological is all mumbo jumbo. It's all you priests. You know, you guys going around telling us what to do again. <laughs> and he said, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> when I got that way, he would, you know, he would, he would look away. He was like, I, he did not like conflict. I don't know about, that was my experience with him. He just did not like to engage me on that. And then he would say to me, he said, but you are a disciple, no? You follow Jesus, no? I said, yeah. He said, well, think about it in that way. Think about what your feminism has to do with Jesus. It was all very, very hard in 1995. It was very hard. I'm beginning to understand a little bit of what he was trying to make me do because he was trying to ask me, how are you going to reconcile the future to your present? Because if we don't do that, we fall out of time. And we fall out of uh, a sense of healthy time that we must inhabit in order for us to have a whole self. So it's only taken me 30 years. You know, I'm, I'm a very poor student, <laughs> clearly. Um, but these are some things you know, that I thought about and I have been thinking about. The form of urgent temporality that we are facing right now for me in my context in Berkeley, California, my students are mostly African-American. The trauma my students and my community face on an everyday basis is astounding. Every day we hear of one more attack on a black body. Every day we hear of one more absolutely violent ending of a black person. And it creates so much sorrow for us uh, and as a theologian, again, to bring my community into thinking about the future, even an eschatological future, seems violent. So I'm just thinking about this, and it's very, very hard. Uh, and, I, and I read a lot of African-American writers as they struggle with this. One of the books I've been reading lately is Resma Menachem's my grandmother's hands. You may know this book. We, we use this book as uh, one of our texts in al almost all of our courses, and we ask people to think about this. And it's a very beautiful way of framing the past present. So Menachem talks about his grandmother's hands that are very thick. They're very thick, and they are chubby, but his own hands are slender and thin and bony. And so he asked his grandmother, are we really related? Look at your hands, they're all so fat and big. Uh, mine are like thin, they're kind of beautiful. 
<laughs> and he said, well, my grandmother would say, you know what these hands can do? I can remind you what these hands can do. Uh, but his grandmother said, well, in this bo these hands used to pick cotton. And when the burrs got into my hands, it would bleed, and then it would scab over. And as it scabbed over, time and time again, the hand, the fingers got thick. So the hand is, a, is an artifact. The hands become the palimpsest, the, the, the tangible reality of a past that is alive in this body. And those hands, he said, once in a while, yes, uh, it would connect with his butt or, or his, uh, you know, or his arm in a tight little slap. Uh, but most of the time, it was soothing and calming. And he said he could never f forget the feel of his grandmother's hands that, had that, that bore the traces of an entire country's history, an entire country's system of existing economically and politically. It's a marvelous discussion of how to think about time in the concrete other than one's own sense of psychologized or subjective time. Uh, in terms of other presentations that happened here, those hands became the art form. That was the art, that was what he looked at, just those chubby hands, which brought him to all of these realizations. So Menachem's book is a, an exploration on what happens to black bodies when, uh, in time when faced with trauma. And here is one of his most astounding sentences. And I'm going to go to town with this sentence. I like, you know, just give me one sentence and we'll take it from there. He said, there is a strange delusion that operates in white bodies, quote, the deadliest manifestation of white fragility is its reflexive confusion of fear with danger and comfort with safety. Its reflexive confusion of fear with danger and comfort with safety. So the white body, when it's afraid, it thinks there is danger. The white body, when it wants comfort, it equates it with safety. But comfort and safety are two different things. Fear and danger are two different things. Fear is something you can own. Danger may be coming to you from the outside, but you have to own your own fear. Now, I know I'm using categories and binaries like white and black. Please don't literalize this. Uh, I frame it in my own context by saying that whiteness comes in many colors. Whiteness inhabits many different kinds of bodies. So this is not a literalization of American politics uh, because American politics or American epistemology, I'm going to say these things because I'm actually an American now. Uh, I, I became a citizen in January, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but anyway, um, there is a form of either or black and white thinking that is actually inimical to the kind of theological reimagination we need to do. So I'm trying to interrupt that while using words that are still slippery. Menachem goes on to write, when a white body feels frightened by the presence of a black one, whether or not an actual threat exists, it might lash out at the black body in what it senses as necessary self-protection. Often this is a fight, flee, or freeze response triggered by the activation of an ancient trauma that began as white-on-white -white violence in Europe centuries ago. So here is his thesis, that the violence that we see directed at black bodies has, has a source. And it has a source buried in the, in the deep memory of bodies that were victims of other forms of violence a long time ago. I find this an interesting interplay of trying to say that trauma is not simply a psychologized response to the immediate and the now. 
In the book, Menachem later on goes on to say, it's not even just the violence of white on white bodies in Europe. It is also the violence of eons ago when we were animals and when we pursued and ate each other. We carry the sense of danger from eons ago. Look at what he's doing. He is drawing out the past. And this is an African-American author, not a religionist. He, does, he doesn't use the language of religion or theology. He's a therapist. I, I don't, he's a licensed therapist. He's not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, but he is drawing out an imaginative reconstruction of the stretch of past. Now, with that deep past in view, he begins to reconstruct the present. So I think Schreiter would have been very diverted by this move. He would have been very interested in this move because for Christian theology, what we need, for it to be relevant anyway, is precisely that drawing out into an ancient deep time. So deep time in the past, because only that kind of a vision of a past, the depth of the past, can connect with deep future. Our problem is that psychological time is too narrow. It is so concentrated in the urgency and the immediacy of the present and the past, especially in the discourses of trauma, because it understands the past as very, approx very proximate to the subject that is speaking. Now again, in an either or frame, one might think, oh well, is he then dismissing the experience or uh, experiences of pain and suffering that people are having. That is not what he's doing. In fact, in aid of deliberative politics, what Menachem is doing is to say, you can't, even as a black body, claim the space of privileged trauma only for yourself. There are forms of trauma that many people experience, which comes from our human condition, and it is far, far, far in the deep past. It's, it's over there. I find this actually more theologically sound and useful than a lot of the more psychologized, immediate experiences of trauma that I have read. Because in that vision, in that sense of a span of time, we can ask the question, why were we made in this way to experience finitude and pain in this way? Why couldn't we have been algae or puppies? Uh, we could have been anything. Instead, we have this capacity for thinking about pain. Everything experiences pain, even plants. But w I don't know if they think about pain, though I have a few animals in my life uh, that might give light to that fact. Uh, some of you know my the animals that I'm talking about. Um, we are able to think about it. It has value, theologically speaking. I can speak to Menachem as a secular therapist and ask, uh, well, how do we make solidarity with each other? Because what you are saying is something I completely understand. I can understand this. So given that kind of a vision, I wanted to work with three theses that Bob gives me the language and the grammar. I say Bob. Bob was my friend. Uh, he was my mentor. He was my teacher. He cajoled, coaxed, and scolded me into who I am. I owe him a, lo a lot. At the same time, I also knew I wasn't his closest friend. I wasn't 
I don't think he never said anything to me. I don't think he thought of me as his even best student. I, I'm saying this in a very honest way. He never said anything to me like that. He always had a twinkle in his eye when we talked. And I would always, one of my biggest conversations with him, which we had every year at the CTSA, every single year we had this conversation, I would say to him, Bob, I don't think, I, I'm running out of time. And he would always roll his eyes and he would say, again, Susan, yes. And I said, Bob, I'm not in time. I'm 10 years older than everybody else. Because I, I get exercised about these things. Because you know, all these young ones with PhDs, and they're 50,000 times more brilliant than anybody I know. And I'm like, I'm not in time. I'm not in time. And he would always say, you're in time. You're in time. And that was, for me, my consolation. So I'm going to think with him. That's why he's here with us today. So what do we do with that statement of Menachem? The deadliest manifestation of white fragility is its reflexive confusion of fear with danger and comfort with safety. So to use some kinds of ecclesiastical, Ecclesiastes language, I think about it theologically as there is a time to refrain from speaking and there is a time to listen. So these come out of what uh, Bob himself writes about reconciliation. Reconciliation is impossible without our listening and without our speaking about it after we process what has happened. I think of the traumas that we live with as news. You know, the, these are, this is news to us. Uh, on May 1st, um, a horrible thing happened in the subways of New York City. You all know this. You know what happened. Talented but unhoused dancer, Jordan Neely, was put in a 15-minute chokehold and killed in broad daylight with other people standing around filming it uh, and people you know, doing nothing about the guy who, was, who had him in a chokehold. Now what, what I'm shocked by over here is both the Democrat mayor and the Democrat governor of the state have pushed a narrative of, well, Neely was you know, unstable. He had mental illness. So somehow the victim is responsible for what happened. What did he do? Well, he was screaming about not having food. He was screaming about not having a home. He was screaming about not having enough to drink. And that discomforted the other riders so much that this guy had to go and act and murder him, just like that. I want to ask this question, who is mentally ill here? Who? Yes, there is the illness of losing control in a society that va highly values control. The, s the right speaking, the right acting, the right sitting and standing. There is that. To call that mental illness, I don't know. What about the mental illness of the person who thinks they're completely justified in jumping on another body and killing them because it made them uncomfortable? And what about the collective mental illness of an entire nation that reads this and does very little? even as we talk consistently and all of the time about a God who loves us. All of these are mental illnesses. You understand my discomfort with the use of these words and how it is used vulgarly in society to blame people on the one hand. The same guy had taken a gun, the, the, the Marine, the ex-Marine, had taken a gun and shot up the entire subway. They would have said he was mentally ill too, but that was his past. That's his pass. He gets a pass. So I am very uncomfortable with the psychology, psychologized use of the concept. Bob used to talk about how difficult it was to speak about reconciliation when violence was actually acted out on the bodies of individuals and of communities. He would always say to me, 
he said, I understand, Susan, why you are a feminist. We used to talk about, well, one of the reasons I left India many, many years ago, 32 years ago now, is because of the gender violence against women in India. That's, you know, that's one of the reasons I left. Uh, in the, in I the Indian culture, even now, is highly stratified in terms of gender. Uh, if one is female, one better act as female. If one is male, one better act as male. I did not occupy that space. I was a queer person in the sense of, uh, I, I, st I stood in the middle. Even when I was a child, I was accused of acting like a boy. Or as my, when I cut my hair, it's all very weird. It might sound to you all like, my God, what is this society? This was only 1980. That only just happened, okay? 1980, uh, a young Indian woman who cuts her hair is, is accused of acting like a man. Why? Because from the back, she looks like a man. I'm like, what back? Look at my back. It's actually quite female. <laughs> what part of my body doesn't look female? Yeah, I'm playing with my hair. But hair, face, body, all of these things, these seem to be, uh, these need to be legible. Because if they're not legible, it creates trauma. I have zero patience with all that kind of nonsense. So occupying those spaces, the queer space, it's an epistemological space, it's a spiritual space, it's an intellectual space. Of course it is a space of sexuality as well. But this is an, it's a liminal space. And Bob would say to me, I understand, I understand why you are a feminist. You are a feminist because in your body you have experienced violence. We didn't use the language of trauma so much in the 90s. And I feel sad by about that too, because Judith Herman's first book was written in 1992. And we were not reading it at CTU. We were also not reading it at other schools that I then went on to be at, even though she was from that school. Her, she did not come into f her full force until women took her work and began to talk about it using the language of trauma. Herman was the first one to break open the fact that what uh, vets coming home from the wars were feeling and doing was similar to women in abusive relationships. That gender violence led to PTSD. Nobody had said that before. So it wasn't until the 2000s that the language of trauma comes into academic use. And I'm sad about that because I think I missed a whole boat. A whole boat went right by my eyes and I wasn't even looking. I was busy with other things. For Schreiter, the only way to counter such a thing, he says, is we have to replace the narrative of the lie with a redeeming narrative. Well, we argued about that too. As I said to him, well, you are a man and you are a priest. Of course your language will be all this, you know, holy, holy stuff. It's all this Christian stuff. Uh, I find very little use in it as a woman. And he would push and push and push and I would push right back. And we, that was our relationship. But what we were doing and what he was doing as a brilliant teacher was he never said to me, that's wrong. He never said to me, you can't think that way. He never said to me, Susan, you're going to fail. What he would do with that chuckle of his, you know, he had that funny chuckle. I, I can't do it. I, I, I don't know how to do that. But he said, <laughs> he would do that thing. And his eyes would twinkle and he would say to me, work with it work with it, see what comes out of it. I'm trying, I, I don't think I'm doing a fantastic job, but I'm trying. We need, in order to counter the lie of supremacy of any kind, whether it is of gender or race or class, whatever it is, the elitism of the academy, we need a different narrative. And one of the, one of the ways in which we can get to that narrative is to be absolutely honest with who we are, to be very self-aware of who we are. 
The way Menachem says it is, there are large numbers of Americans who are white, racist, and proud to be both, an even larger number who are white, racist, and in reflexive denial about it, and another large number who are white, progressive, and ashamed of their whiteness. All of these forms are forms of immaturity. They are trauma responses, and they are actively harming black Americans and white Americans. These are dehumanized, depersonalized uh, ways of thinking about complicity. The word complicity was evoked in our conversation here this afternoon. For Schreiter, redemption only happened in the future. Uh, as I was reading through uh, reading Schreiter through Menachem and Menachem through Schreiter, a, 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 a thought about Jalaluddin Rumi and one of the things he said about truth sparked something. Uh, this is what Rumi said about truth. Interesting thing about truth. You know, the one time that question was asked, what is truth, was met with silence. So according to Rumi, truth is a mirror that God held. And one day it fell and shattered into a million pieces. Human beings picked up a piece each, but each of them thought that they had the whole truth. So the perspectival aspect of truth, the idea that the only truth we know is the truth of our own perceptions, and, and, and that we're limited by that, is a learning, a humility that we need to enter if we are actually going to think and do reconciliation. That all we know is a piece of it. One of the reasons I've thought, you know, often when Pilate said to Jesus, well, what is truth? The age old question. And there is silence there. To me, what the gospels are saying, saying is, in this time, you had to shut up and listen. Listen to what is not being said. Listen to what cannot be said. Listen to what may never be said because what was standing in front of you was the truth. And the only way you would know the truth is to be in relationship with it. You can't speak about it. You can't just say that we have the truth. And now that's Schreiter. That's Schreiter pushing me to think in ways that is also making me uncomfortable. Because remember, I was a fundamentalist feminist. I had my truth. Women were good. Men were bad. Oh, I didn't go that far. But um, <laughs> I mean, that's really silly. But I had to really reconsider whether what I was saying was truly liberation or simply another form of projection of my own ego. He brought me there. Make it work, he said. Go, so, go do some work with it, he said. And that's what happened to me. Menachem talks about another thing, and this is my second thesis. He says there is clean pain and there is dirty pain. Clean pain is the kind of pain all of us experience. It comes, it's an existential idea. It comes out of us because we understand our finitude. It comes out of us because we know that we have but a short trip from birth to the end of that phase of being. In one way, if we are very, very lucky, it's about eight decades, 80 years, 90 years. That's our lifespan. And if we didn't have that limited lifespan, we would be like algae. We would cover the face of the earth and we would kill our young. The only way that our young could have life is for us to leave, for us to die, for us to move on and leave some of the children wondering, wait, wait, what? You left without me? And you're asking me to do this? I ask him almost every week, like, why? I can't do this, Bob. I don't know how to do this. 
I'm getting out of the way, he said, and he left. I don't know. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't speak to me anymore. There is a time in my Ecclesiastes re reframing, clean pain and dirty pain. There is a time to stop talking about one's dirty pain. Dirty pain is the result of trauma, but it is also the result of thinking about trauma as only referring to me and myself. I know what this sounds like. It might sound like you are denying my experience. You are not giving uh, my experience the importance and significance it deserves. You're moving too fast. Yes, I know. But this is an, this is an author who has lived through it. And I'm going to trust what he is saying. I'm not going to bring my academic adversarial attitude to what he's saying and saying, well, the, you know, that's not going to work. He's saying this. When black people and white people act out of their trauma, it is dirty pain. That dirty pain is intergenerational. It travels. Uh, years ago, I remember standing at Harvard Square with a Pakistani friend of mine. We were talking, and she was telling me, she said, well, you don't know this about me, Susan, but I, I have, I'm, I'm a super nervous person. I have anxiety. So I'm always you know, interested when people say that. So I'm like, okay, what are your symptoms? How does it manifest? And she said, oh, she said it's uh, night sweats, sweats, uh, chills, shivers, just total anxiety. I, I, I lose my voice. I said, would you call it trauma? And she said, no, no, I hate that word. And I said, you hate that word, but what you're describing is what everybody says is trauma. She said, no, no, that word doesn't describe what I am saying. Because every single one of the women in my family, and she said, Susan, even my five-year-old niece has this thing that they do. I said, what is it? What is it? And she said, it started in the partition. We were displaced from our house, and my uh, great-grandmother at the time fled with her children uh, across the border and they saw horrible things, horrible things. Uh, and they arrived in India. And so they're Muslims in India, but they originally uh, were from Pakistan. But the, the pain that she carries, she has, she at the time, she must have been, I don't know, like 20 years old. My, my, when I was talking to her, my friend, she had no direct experience of the partition. I don't have direct experience of the partition, but the the intergenerational trauma of that partition absolutely lived in their bodies. And she said, I can't say about my five-year-old, Aisha was the five-year-old niece's name. I can't say that Aisha has trauma. This is something bigger, bigger. And that, again, you know, immediately sparked my interest. Menachem talks about uh, the internalized uh, trauma uh, experiences acting out from dirty pain of black people. When black people paint each other as not black enough, too black, too dark, or whatever it is, you know, whatever it is all of that going on. I know it from a brown person's uh, perspective. I remember the first time I, w when I went back to India after being in the United States uh, for three years, I went back home, and one of my cousins said to me, wow, you're still so dark. And I looked at her and I said, what? And she said, but you live with white people. Don't you think you should become white? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one walks away from such things because otherwise you will say things that other people will remember forever. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. But that kind of stupidity is, I I it's very alive in our world. And it comes out of trauma. That is dirty pain. And what Menachem says is we need to find ways to metabolize this. So not to erase it, not to deny it, not to reject it, not to make it disappear, but to metabolize it. We have to make it part of who we are and somehow use it for the thriving and liberation of others. Now, do we have a plan and a program? Well, Bob and I used to talk about plans and programs. You know, he used to say, okay, so you're a feminist and all, so what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do for the women of the world, Susan? And I would say, I'm going to educate them. Okay, how are you going to do that? Um, so just think about it. You know, when I first came to the United States, the whole idea was, and some of you will remember this, uh, I remember writing in my personal statement, I want to get um, 
masters in something or the other, I can't remember now, and then go back to India and uh, help women. That's what I said. Did I go back? Why didn't I go back? Because then I realized I am not capable. I am not, I don't know how to do this. My program is just idealistic. It was unrealistic. I don't know how to educate women. So he would tease me and he would say, but he was my teacher, he was my mentor. And he would say to me, so what else can you do, Susan, since you can't go around you know, educating the whole, you know, whole of the half billion people who are women in India? Since you can't do that, what else can you do? And I said, well, maybe I can teach uh, young people. He said, where? I said, um, I don't know, anywhere? And then he looked at me and said, yes anywhere it doesn't matter where you you don't it's not india it's not it's not it's not just your context it is anywhere anywhere deserves your energy anywhere deserves your plan so if a plan was limiting bob was skeptical about it so what did he do for me as a student he made me he made me open open my horizon, well, he made me have an unattainable horizon. And I have been running, 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 running to that ever receding horizon. And I have done my work, I think, or I'm trying to do my work because it is an ever receding horizon. If it was, oh God, my thing is uh, telling me that I'm almost up out of time, shoot, okay couple more things, just a couple more things. One of the things that, uh, a third thing that we have to do is to rise above our individualistic concerns and think about the broader concerns of humanity. So there is a time to refrain from speaking just about personal suffering, but a time to inhabit the suffering of the world. There's one sentence in uh, Bob's book on reconciliation in which he says this. S I have this thing with one sentences. He says, our orthodoxies will fail. Our orthopraxies will fail. What will remain is orthopathema. Classic academic. What to what? <laughs> Who's going to remember that, Bob? No, it's not even sexy. You can't even say it. <laughs> but what did he mean? the right way to inhabit suffering. Orthopathema, the right way to inhabit suffering. The two presenters that were here before, they talked about empathy. I teach a whole class called the limits of empathy. Everybody hates it. <laughs> it's such a liberal value, you know? I mean, I mean, I'm empathic, I'm great. I'm like, no, there are limits to it, especially if it comes out of dirty pain and the ego. Right suffering, how do we get there? So Bob has a plan, and if you were here, I would have said, yeah, but okay for you to have a plan, not okay for me to have a plan. How is this? <laughs> These are aspects of his plan, his program for reconciliation, active listening, symbolic reimagination. We fought about this. I would, I would say to him, how am I supposed to say to the people of the world that one of my best teachers is a priest of the precious blood? You know, at places like Harvard, that sounds really weird. <laughs> and I told him, that sounds really weird, Bob. Precious blood? Like what? And he said, why? What's your problem with blood? I said, no, it's your problem with blood. <laughs> I said, all blood? Menstrual blood? Blood of childbirth? Are you okay with those? Or is it just your blood? And he's like, okay, okay, okay. He said, uh, <laughs> he didn't like talking about that. He would be like, uh, so symbolic reimagination of the, of the materiality of life, blood, water, bodies. They were hard and they're still hard questions. So whose blood? He said he began to think about it because of what he saw in Latin America and what he saw as the work of women in Latin America about the blood of their children because those women refused to give up hope. That's why he wrote that whole beautiful thing way before any of the feminists 
uh, took on the bandwagon of trauma and you know suffering and healing. They all came in the late 2000s. He was writing about it in 1997. He said, if you think about what happened at the tomb and what the women were doing at the tomb, they were, in a pithy phrase, pedagogues of hope because they refused to believe that spilled blood meant the end. We had to learn from that because those mothers, even though their children were disappeared, refused to be dehumanized. He said that was his lesson. That was the meaning of, that is the meaning of precious blood. I was always moved by it. Contemplation. Sometimes he was hard to talk to because he wouldn't talk. Then I had to talk. Then I'd be like, oh God, why am I just going on? And we'd meet on Zoom, and then I'd be, blah, 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 you know, I'd be saying this vomit, this barrage of words, and he'd be just sitting there silent as, you know, Yoda. <laughs> there was nothing. I was like, I'd try to probe, like, hello, hello, are you there? He wouldn't say anything, but he was a contemplative. After a while, the words were irrelevant. One time he told me, he said, Susan, I'm so tired talking about reconciliation. I said, you are? I said, but that's what you're famous for. He said, but that's exactly the problem. It's as if that is all I have done. What is there beyond the concept? What is there more than the word reconciliation? What is there to Bob that was more than? I only caught glimpses of it, just, you know, glimpses. And then he would say to me, on the other hand, you can't just give up and say we can't use our languages. He said, I am a man. I am a priest. I am a priest of the precious blood. I'm a missionary of the precious blood. I am going to use my grammar. You are a woman. You are a feminist. Go use your grammar. But think about how it is going to truly work towards the liberation of many. You have to think about that, Susan. I don't think I'm a great, uh, I, I, I'm not greatly successful. I'm still thinking, but he helped me move beyond the personal to the cosmos. So I'll end with a story, very brief, a s short story. Uh, a guru was approached by his disciple who said, I have all the suffering in my life, all the suffering. I, I, I don't know what to do with all the suffering. Can you help me? And the guru said, okay, do one thing. Get me a glass of water and put half a cup of salt in it. Stir it, not drink it. So the disciple drank it and spat it all out. He said, horrible, horrible, it's bitter. So the guru said, okay, now take that salty water and walk with me to the lake over there and let's put this in the lake. We put, he put, they put it in the lake. And then the guru said, now drink the water of the lake. What does the water taste like to you? Sweet. So the guru looked at him and said, do you understand? Your pain needs a container, not a small one, a large one. That is what Bob taught me. Your pain needs a container, a large one, as large as the universe. Thank you. So Susan, thank you so much for your generous reflections, for sharing your intellect. Very, very grateful to you. And so before we open it up for q and I'm going to pass my computer over to, to Dr. Stephanie Edwards. If you could look at the question to come in through the Zoom, I'll bring it over to you. And let's start off with anybody who's here in person. So Susan gave us all kinds of great things to think about as far as trauma, the limits, and the challenges of, of that language, about uh, thinking about suffering, so many good things here for us to think about. So I'd like to offer it first to folks in the room. Anybody has questions for Susan? Uh, Susan, thank you so much. Uh, presentation, and I really appreciate your um, concept of time space. 
darkness. And it makes me think of Shelley Rock and her work on um, Holy Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And how trauma gets stuck. And um, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and so I wonder if you um, kind of see those as, as similar uh, partners as, as we're putting language into, theological language mm -hmm. into this notion of mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, uh, Shelley's work is really about the work of waiting and how waiting uh, metabolizes trauma in a certain way. That's why Holy Saturday is holy. Um, we talked about it, Shelley and I are friends, and we talked about it a lot. Uh, the, it was a f for her, it was very important to, be, to have a feminist take on it. So she was retrieving a moment of what m for a lot of people might look like passivity. She was retrieving that for feminist purposes. And that's the kind of queering of uh, language and uh, disposition that we need in the world. That the binaries of you know active and passive, the binaries of waiting and doing, all of these binaries need to be interrupted. That trauma would be very good at doing, because only in w only in queering the binaries can we find where to be in our contemporary world with its complexity. So yes, thank you. I just want to say thank you for the presentation. As you spoke, one thing came to my mind. You said that um, if the, uh, this is my question actually, if the past is not to be forgotten when we address uh, trauma and it's necessary for building the future, how does one heal from trauma because it's still present? Yes, uh, in Schreiter's work, one of the things he says is we cannot uh, forget. We may not forget the events, the traumatic events, but in speaking about it, it loses a, it loses its capacity to become dirty, if that makes sense, to now m mesh the two thinkers together. Speaking about it allows us to metabolize it. Now, what does speaking entail? I'm speaking, but I'm speaking in a community. It implies the presence of others who are receiving it. It implies that trauma may be metabolized only in community really can't metabolize it by ourselves. So speaking about it defangs it in a way. I, n I think what you're asking is, but doesn't speaking about it cause us to relive it again and again and again? Uh, Judith Herman in her latest book, um, Repair, m Repair, and I can't remember the name of it, sorry. Uh, it, it was just published, just came out. Uh, she talks, uh, she says that uh, it, it, it doesn't, you don't have to relive it. Speaking about it actually allows you to gain distance from it. Um, she talked about this example of a rape survivor uh, who's, who was asked by a bunch of college students, what, what was the most, what is the most difficult thing about your trauma? And what the survivor said was how boring it has become. She said, I hate talking about it now. It's not because I have forgotten. It's not even because I, it's, you know, I don't want to think about it. It's just become so banal. And what you have done, according to that, uh, that, that particular example anyway, is she has spoken about it so many times that it lost its power to control her. So again, speaking has to be done in community. It has to be done with another receptive, kind human being who understands and receives. And and that is part of the metabolizing journey. Uh, thank you. We have a couple of questions from Zoom. Vanessa's on it. The title is Truth and Repair. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question from Leon, thanking you for your talk, and also drawing back to 
um, our panel, particularly for prison chaplaincy and work there. Um, any thoughts on tying this idea of waiting and spiritual pain, which becomes live in the context of imprisonment and prison chaplaincy? Hmm. That is an area that I know very, very little about. Um, I don't even know how to hazard an answer there. I'm so sorry, Leon. Um, I don't know. For me, all I know is this. I'm, I'm going to say it in words that are really terrible, terrible words. I thought my life in India was like prison. Terrible words, because it is nothing like what I understand the lives of incarcerated human beings to be. But my naive, stupid understanding of it is that it is this it is this loss of my humanity. And I don't know how our systems of punishment and containment can ever be humane. I don't I don't know. I am so sorry, I don't have an answer for that. This may not be an answer to that, but um, I I, uh, I work at a center for underserved women, and I'm a psychologist, and I train students. And one of the students that I trained, after she left us, she got her PhD, and she um, she started to work in a prison in California, and she works with inmates who are in for life who have committed murder, et cetera, some of the most horrendous experiences. And we asked her to come back and talk to us about her work and what she does. And she said, when I work with the prisoners, she said, there is no possibility of an external change in their lives. Their life is going to be what they experience today, tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, and the day after that. It does not change. What has to change and what I work with in these men is their internal life and how they think and how they feel. Part of it involves going back over their past and understanding part of what their past, how their past shaped them. But it's not just that. It's more than that. It's, it's kind of like putting the salt water in the lake. It's making a bigger container in a setting that has absolutely no hope of an external bigger container. So thank you for that, that story. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I'd like to ask for your help with language really, really deeply appreciating your anecdote that you started with, which is reminding us that this word trauma is being used vulgarly, and also appreciating what you've done with this notion of, of time sickness, which says that entire cultures can fall out of time in a way. So how do we talk about trauma that is somewhere in the middle of not everything is trauma, mm -hmm. and we are not all traumatized, mm -hmm. right? So how do we say that while at the same time recognizing the big, profound, cosmological thing you just did? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, this is why I like Menachem's uh, understanding of clean pain and dirty pain. So clean pain is, we have accounts by our ancestors, by you know human beings that have thought about this and chronicle that in so many ways through art, through uh, poetry, they chronicle this. That's what they were grappling with, finitude. But dirty pain is the one that inflicts harm on others unnecessarily. And that I think we need many, many mechanisms to help. My difficulty with thinking about how to metabolize dirty pain and only psychology is that um, Again, I'm not a psychologist, it's not my field of expertise, but it's as if we can attempt to, no, I'm going to say everything that is completely wrong. I'm, I'm going to stop myself right there. No, 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 you're not going to go over there. 
uh, I, I think it's limited. It could we could add to it by thinking in terms that are theological. Um, when I was very young, I had a an uncle who was a gadfly, you know, and he loved irritating me. I, I was very religious. They all thought I was going to be a nun. And was even now, they still say, when are you going to go become that nun? I said, I am. Um, <laughs> I mean, anyhow, so he would say to me, so what is the meaning of being washed in the blood of the lamb? What was that? What is the meaning of that? Now, to a young child, it's, you know, jar what does it mean? But I did not have the words that it was a metaphor. As a child, I received it literally. And he was poking at that. But because I knew that there was something more than those words, I held on to that. So I, that's one of the things I ask my students. What is more than the words? We have a whole course at PSR called More Than Words. Uh, and sometimes we think about art. Sometimes we think about apophasis. Sometimes we think about negative theology. The, the somebody is presenting a paper on negative thought uh, uh, in, these, in these days. Those forms of negative thinking are very, very useful for us. So the lake is an idea of the negative, really, without negating, I think. But no, I love playing around with language, as did Bob, you know. So we have time for one last question, either in person or on Zoom. Useless. Uh, so carrying on with what Heather had asked, um, what word would you use instead of trauma? I, I know you use dirty pain and, and clean pain, but I, I it doesn't capture sort of sort of the the complexity, the, the complicated way that it's been done, right? So what would you use, or would you use another term? Thank <laughs> you.